Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mike Gonzalez. First of all, I want to thank you for attending the Northwell Sports Medicine Symposium. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing managing the diabetic athlete at the high school and the collegiate setting. Um, so first off, um, let's try and understand here the difference between a type 1 diabetic versus a type 2. Um, they are two different pathologies. So with type 1, obviously, um, this is something where the immune system attacks the beta cells in the pancreas and the patient cannot create insulin or very little insulin. Whereas type 2 is a metabolic disorder, uh, usually brought on by lifestyle choices, genetic factors. Um, this is where the body has become either insulin resistant or they don't produce enough insulin. Um, presentation and onset symptoms develop pretty quickly for type 1 diabetics, usually are in the earlier years. Um, research shows that um, type 1 diabetes usually pops up between the ages of 4 and 7, and then another higher rate around ages 10 to 14, which is very important for us that work at the high school level, uh, considering that falls within our age, age range that we see. Um, type 2 diabetics, okay, they can develop in childhood or at any time. Um, again, usually happens over months to years. Um, you can also be pre-diabetic um, before you actually go into full-blown type 2 diabetes. Um, the other important note here is type 1 diabetics, there is no cure, it's not reversible, whereas type 2 with the right, pro, uh, right, right program from your doctor, diet and exercise, um, you can actually reverse the condition. Um, oh, let me go back here. So uh, risk factors. Um, family history and genetics um, play a factor in both conditions. Um, environmental factors play a role in type 1, and then of course body composition and lifestyle choices play a major role in type 2. Uh, treatments for both, you're talking about insulin injections, glucose monitoring um, for type 2 diabetics, of course, for any individual, whether you're diabetic or not, of course, diet and exercise are important, but you also have to know the pharmaceutical medications that might be going into a type 2's plan. Prevalence in athletes, you'll see as we go forward with the statistics that both are, are low. Type 2 is actually very low in athletes, considering, you know, how the uh, disease progresses and how it um, happens, um, whereas you know, type one, again, there's really no control over if you become a type one diabetic. So some really quick statistics, all right, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. So in 2018, uh, in the USA, 34.2 million people were diagnosed. Of those 34.2, you're talking about 1.6 were type one, and of those 1.6, 187 were adolescents, meaning they were under the age of 20. So if you break down the numbers statistically, you're talking about a 0.005, 4% of the diabetic population being type 1 under the age of 20. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, I made a nice little chart. Everybody loves charts. So diabetics by type, type 1, you can see very small piece of the pie compared to type 2. And then of those type 1 by age, again, a pretty substantially small um, piece of the pie for, for adolescent diabetics. So what we're really just going to talk about today is understanding and monitoring uh, type 1 diabetics, um, signs and symptoms to watch for, treatments and management, and then emergency situations um, that may occur. So why is it dangerous? Uh, type 1 diabetics, uh, it's uh, associated with hyperglycemia, which is basically high blood sugar. You can see to the diagram to my, uh, on the screen here, you have someone who does not have diabetes, what it would look like in someone with diabetes you know, just to give you an idea of, of what happens. Um, if it goes left untreated, hyperglycemia can lead to diabetic coma. Also, hypoglycemia can lead to diabetic coma, which we'll talk about the differences between the two here in a second. Um, and then, of course, you can have kidney damage and other organ damage if hyperglycemia goes untreated. So what are some levels that we're looking at here? Um, for diabetics, um, anything of a fasted uh, glucose level above 126 can be considered hyperglycemic if they're fasted. Um, if they just ate a meal um, after two hours, if their blood sugar levels are above 200, that can also be considered hyperglycemic. And then symptoms of hyperglycemia typically can be seen or noticed when the blood sugar is above 180. Um, so why is it dangerous? We just kind of touched on that, but let's also talk uh, about hypoglycemia. So because of the insulin therapies that a type 1 is undergoing, they're very vulnerable to severe shifts in blood sugar, especially hypoglycemia, and especially when it comes to exercise. When you look at the chart here on the right, you can see the, the levels that you, you want to live in, that normal range and borderline are okay. You might have some athletes that train at a hyperglycemic level on purpose to avoid hypoglycemia. Again, you know, it's very important 
uh, to know your athletes, which we'll get into in a second, and what their normal blood sh uh, sugar levels and A1C levels look like. Um, symptoms related to hypoglycemia usually occur when the blood glucose falls, uh, and this can be for anyone, not even just a diabetic, when the blood uh, glucose falls below 70, you're going to start to see some symptoms show up, such as dizziness, fatigue, um, and lightheadedness. Um, additional factors that lead to hypoglycemia during exercise, okay, this really pertains to us athletic trainers that are dealing with athletes while they're working out or participating in games. Um, the injected insulin absor uh, absorption when exercising exercising. Um, it actually increases, okay? And then the body, because they're of a type 1 diabetic, they don't have the ability to decrease that plasma insulin, which can lead to a condition known as hyperinsulinemia, um, which is basically the body's, you know, it's on, it, the insulin levels continue to rise during exercise, um, and then you have impaired release of uh, glucose counter-regulatory hormones like glucagon, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So managing diabetes. Uh, the biggest thing with a diabetic athlete is knowing your diabetic athlete. Again, it's a, it's pretty low prevalence. About one in every 400 kids have type 1 diabetes. So if you're at the high school level or at the college level, an annual PPE uh, that identifies your type 1 diabetics, and then when you see them come across your desk or if you're speaking with your nurse or by however you, you know, figure out who your diabetics are, go speak to them them. That way you know what they look like. Um, it's very important. So that way when they're out on the field or they're at practice or at a game, if they go down, you recognize them immediately. Um, and then once you talk to them, educate them if they're not already educated. Many diabetics are very well versed in how their treatment plan needs to operate. They know what foods to eat. They, they come prepared with snacks. They come prepared um, with their, you know, their, their self-carry glucagon. Or if you're holding their glucagon for them. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but a lot of them are educated, but if they're not, sit down and talk to them about carbohydrate supplementation and then signs and symptoms to recognize during exercise when they might be leading you know, down a dangerous road. And then finally, have a plan. Um, so I actually have here with me um, one of my athletes' um, diabetic plans. Okay, this is something I coordinate with my nurse um, it base, uh, basically has the diabetic plan for each individual athlete written up by their doctor. Um, so it tells you the levels at which, you know, they want them to operate. This is something that if you have a diabetic athlete, you should always have this. Keep it in your kit. Keep it close by. And then, of course, if they're self-carry, they should have basically an identical copy of this with them at all times. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have the emergency of uh, glucagon uh, injection that you can administer with, a, again, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but have a plan, have a diabetic plan, and then if it, things get out of hand, you just activate your EAP. Um, also there, the last point, guidelines for play, not play. You know, set strict numbers with your, with your diabetic athletes so you know if they're, again, if they're high, super high, we're gonna talk about ketone testing. You know, that's something to watch for. If they're low, you know, make sure they get their numbers up to normal before they start participating. Biggest thing about diabetes is is prevention. There's, you know, I've I've worked with a number of diabetic athletes, and luckily I've never had to go into an AAP or go into an emergency uh, situation because anytime an athlete seemed to be or developing symptoms of hyper or hypoglycemia, you know, you take care of it before it gets to the point where emergency medical assistance is needed. So prevention is key here, it, and just like with a lot of other injuries and illness we deal with on a daily basis. So number one way to prevent is monitor glucose, okay? Nowadays, I would say the biggest change in how we manage diabetes is how we test blood sugar. Um, and, you know, there's two ways to do it. You can do the finger blood test, which has been, you know, the gold standard for, for many years. But now we're starting to see these continuous glucose monitors come out um, that literally it's a, have a whole closed chain loop on how to monitor the blood sugar and insulin levels of your diabetic athletes. Um, and, you know, doing some research that I've done over the past several weeks into this, it's pretty remarkable now. I mean, they pretty much call it an artificial pancreas because the machines actually manage the insulin and the glucose pretty seamlessly. So if monitoring with blood tests, athletes should test 20, 30 minutes before. If they get a break in half, you know, if they don't have a continuous monitor, take another look, make sure that the levels are still normal. And then one thing to be aware of is make sure they're testing after activity because you can have diabetics that can go hypoglycemic 
two, maybe four hours after their activity because of the intensity of the activity. Obviously, if you're using a continuous glucose monitor, it'll monitor in real time. And like I just said, intensity of the activity plays a major role. Uh, anaerobic activity has been shown to actually increase blood sugar levels, whereas, you know, uh, consistent aerobic activity will decrease them at a more steady rate. So this is just, I wanted to put this up. This is an example of a closed loop control system. You see that it has a continuous glucose monitor sensor. That sensor then sends messages to an app on a cell phone. And then that app on the cell phone, the athlete or the athletic trainer, whoever's managing it, can actually then send that information to the pump. And then the pump will self-adjust the insulin levels. It's pretty remarkable. Um, I think we're going to start to see a lot of this, especially in athletics. Um, know your equipment. Know what you're using. Make sure you can identify what equipment you have. Here you have your basic, you know, finger uh, blood glucose test. You have your insulin pump down here. And then you also have the patch over here to the left, um, which is used to monitor glucose throughout the day. I believe most of the models, when I was looking, they monitor without having to change for about 10 to 14 days. Um, so, you know, that is very convenient for the athlete. Um, number one thing, too, with equipment is know your athlete and know their sport. Make sure that the device is in an area that isn't, you know, a high risk for contact uh, for them to fall on because then that could damage the device, which would then, you know, cause problems when it comes to, to numbers and, and regulating their blood sugar. Um, so let's talk about signs and symptoms. Let's say that monitoring, you know, you've been good, the athlete's been good, but, you know, they have an episode. Um, so you're talking about hyperglycemia, you know, anything over 200, you can start to see these effects. If you get up into the 250, 300 range, you really want to, you know, take a look at that athlete. You might even be doing some urine testing to see if there's any ketones in their urine. If there are ketones, exercise is absolutely contraindicated. If there's no ketones, then it's something that, you know, exercise with caution. Um, some of the symptoms, as you can see here, nausea, blurred vision, fatigue, fruity breath is a big one. Um, and then, of course, rapid breathing. Um, you definitely want to be on the lookout for um, when it comes to you know hyperglycemia. Hypo, again, you can break it up into two categories, mild and severe. If they're mild, they are conscious, they're able to swallow. You can usually handle the situation pretty easily, get them a car uh, carbohydrated um, snack or drink. Uh, but if they have excessive sweating, palpitations, headache, they might be, their blood sugar might be dipping. If your athlete becomes unconscious or unable to swallow, this is an automatic medical emergency, okay, you're going to have to activate your EAP and then start anticipating they'll have to use the glucagon um, injection. Um, so basically treating hyperglycemia, again, high intensive exercise is when you can see hyperglycemia get out of control because it will uh, lead to a spike in blood sugar, which can then lead to ketoacidosis. Uh, so treatment plan, uh, glucose reading, if blood sugar continues to rise during exercise, um, if it gets over 250, test, for, test the urine. If ketones present, do not exercise. Consume more water. Uh, additional uh, or increased dose of insulin may be warranted. So that one gets a little tricky, okay? And I'm going to show you why. There's many, many different types of insulin out there. You need to understand that if you get to that point where their blood sugar is on the rise and you're going to adjust their insulin levels, look at your diabetic care plan because how to do it and what they should be using should all be in here prescribed by their doctor. Don't go cowboy and try and, you know, just make things up on the fly. This is more important for the, you know, the collegiate setting because at the, um, at the uh, high school setting, you know, again, you can usually get the parents to the site if they need to go home um, and get their insulin adjusted, they can do so. Um, but for the collegiate setting, again, this might fall on you. So be aware of what kind of insulin you're using and at what dosage it should be administered. So again, this is just kind of like an overwhelming slide. So treating hypoglycemia, uh, mild hypoglycemia, which we talked about, they're conscious um, and able to respond to you. Administer 10 to 15 grams of fast acting carbohydrates, such as glucose, honey or sugar. Measure their blood glucose um, when you administer and 15 minutes after. Again, it's really just a cycle of test, administer, test, administer. If blood levels don't change after two attempts, go into your EAP, all right? If it's severe, you're activating the EAP right away. Prepare the glucagon injection with the instructions that are inside, okay? It will walk you through how to mix the injection based on what type of glucagon injection you have. Once it's prepared, it goes in the upper arm, upper thigh, or the buttock. 
Okay, again, it shouldn't be intermuscular. It should just be subcutaneous. You don't want to get into the muscle. Um, and again, I'll touch more on preparing a glucagon injection in a second. Uh, once the athlete does become conscious and responsive, administer a carbohydrate-based food or beverage, and then try and normalize their blood sugar. So that was a mouthful. I only had 15 minutes. So uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot more we could touch on. But, you know, if you're traveling with a diabetic athlete, make sure they have what they need to keep their blood sugar level. Uh, pump, monitor the placement, which we kind of touched on. Uh, and also a topic of interest is wound and injury healing for diabetes. If their blood glucose is out of control, how it could affect them recovering. And this is a link to a website. Uh, it's newyork.gov. It's something that my nurse and I and all the personnel here, we do training um, on how to administer glucagon. Again, if you're at the high school setting, this is something that should be written and uh, discussed with your nurse, um, your, your CMO, your chief medical officer. And it should be understood that, you know, if you're doing something like this, that you are clear to do it with, you know, everyone that's part of the diabetic care team, um, including the parents. So with that being said, thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful and uh, enjoy the rest of the symposium.